So we have Alex Alpert, who's NetHope's Membership Engagement Manager, and David Goodman, who's um, NetHope's CIO in Residence, who are going to um, be talking with us now. Good morning, everybody. Seems like a uh, tired room, and now we get to talk about survey results. So <laughs> we'll try to make it as interesting as possible. Can you hear me okay back there? Yeah, okay, great. So uh, I'm Alex Alpert, uh, here with NetHope. Uh, David Goodman, everybody knows, and our colleague Eric Walker from Inside NGO is here with us today. Uh, we are going to be discussing uh, two different surveys that our organizations did. Uh, NetHope members uh, were asked to fill an IT benchmark survey over the last few months. And um, our colleague Eric uh, Walker, who's with Inside NGO, uh, also had a survey more of an operational survey uh, looking for some metrics uh, with inside NGO members. Uh, and many of our members are also inside NGO members, so we thought this would be a, a good time for us to sh share the data. So uh, um, the last, I think the last chapter, the European chapter, uh, I wasn't there, so I'm looking at David. That was you, I okay. Uh, but I hear there was a lot of discussion about the need to have some IT benchmarking metrics, uh, that they're, that the, the group felt that um, although there are metrics, uh, like the uh, Gardner metrics that are used for the for-profit world, that we were missing an opportunity perhaps for us to be gathering data amongst our peer organizations and, and try to really start to think about what we could be doing to start gathering this information, um, to be able to compare our institutions to look at where there's opportunities. So we uh, listen to our members, and like many of the projects that happen with NetHope, they start with our members and developed into the survey. Uh, we, whoop, not going. Oh, there it's going, whoops, sorry, I just read the wrong thing. So there was a survey design committee that was put together with um, our members. Uh, it was led uh, with uh, Lisa Obradovich and uh, Frank Scott from NetHope. And they put together, uh, there were a lot of drafts of this uh, survey that went out, and the idea was to really try to start gathering this data um, around IT spending, or looking at the differences between IT spending in the field and the headquarters and involvement uh, with uh, the CIOs uh, at different uh, levels, both in the headquarters and in the field. So thank you, Lisa, who is not here, but I wanted to make sure I extended a big thank you to her. So we had, uh, we received 25 responses back from uh, the survey we sent. These are the members that responded, so thank you very much. Uh, it was probably very time consuming. Uh, some of the, it's like taxes, you know, it's like you see these things, you're like, you know you have, you know you have all the information, but getting to it is sometimes really hard. Uh, so it takes time, and I really appreciate those that took the time to do that. So of the 25 respondents, the, uh, that represented about, I think, 21 um, of our organizations. Some of our respondents came from multiple uh, countries, offices. Uh, we had 12 from the U.S., 11 from Canada, uh, one from Australia, and... Germany. No, sorry, 11 from the EU and one from Canada. I had those numbers mixed up. And the revenue of the organizations were anywhere from 66 million to, uh, uh, I think 1.1 was our largest uh, in revenue. Um, so again, thank you to all of you who took the time to fill this uh, the survey out. So the idea behind having the survey, it was really to start thinking about how our members can help each other um, and also for us in the hope to really start to learn more about our members and to figure out, making sure that we are uh, gathering the information and then, again, sharing it with you. Um, our hope is that uh, post-summit that we can try to share some individual data with the members who uh, participate in the survey so they can see where they fall into the results. Uh, we, kept, we kept the uh, organizations anonymous for all of our results. Uh, but if you're interested in learning more about where you fell, uh, I would be happy to do that after the summit, maybe a week after the summit. <laughs> uh, but beyond that, I think the, the thing that was kind of exciting about this is that because there was a lack of uh, 
of metrics around IT benchmarking um, in the nonprofit world that pot potentially this could be the start of a, 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 a way for us to really impact the sector. So my hope is that this is one of many. Um, sorry for those that don't like to fill out surveys, but perhaps we can find other creative ways to start gathering some of this data. Uh, Lauren, you were great yesterday setting us up with the whole data, 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 <laughs> because it is, it's important. Uh, that's how we know more about you, and I think the more our members know about each other, uh, the better it is for everybody. So with any survey, there are major challenges. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for us was the sample size. Uh, having 25 uh, respondents, or about half of uh, our members, uh, you know, is potentially pretty biased sample size, but in any case, I think it, it generally is gonna give us a very good um, s start, an indicator of where we should be looking for things. Um, our data, I felt, David and I probably both felt, was very soft in that we were trying to make a comparison among uh, many organizations that were so different. Um, and you, it, I think once you start looking at an organization's budget, you can really see how the structure of an organization makes it very difficult to compare uh, e even simple things like IT spending in the field because it's so different among so many of your organizations. So it's a good lesson to us and how we ask questions in the future, knowing that there's not a one size fits all. Uh, so that's uh, our, one of our biggest challenges we had with the survey, uh, trying to kind of fill in the holes where we, where we could. So some of you were kind enough to spend even a little bit more time with David and I on the phone to try to fill in the mi missing pieces. So again, thank you for your time. And then the third piece is you know, resources. So we, you know, I've worked a little bit with surveys, David's worked with surveys, uh, but there's people that do this all the time for a living and they're, you know, they write professional surveys and they analyze them. And so I think as this grows, I think there's an opportunity for our members to collaborate and potentially get involved uh, with uh, a, perhaps a more robust uh, uh, survey process and uh, look forward to talking to some of our members about that. And if you're interested in, in doing that, please talk to us uh, sometime over the next couple days. And then there was this other challenge that we really should have listed, which was, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, David said, hey, let's do this on Tableau. <laughs> Great, okay, sure. So, you know, he's a CIO, so right, he can do Tableau. Right. Well, we learned it very fast. And our great partners at Tableau, uh, Neil, helped us get the right people and somehow magically we semi-learned it. And uh, the great thing is that you know, we invested some time into it. Uh, it was a great tool. Uh, look forward to, to keep training on it and to do a lot more work on this because it, is, it was really a helpful tool for us. So the last thing here before we actually get into the results is you know ask yourself do you like as as Dave is talking about the data do you like what you're what you're seeing it's not perfect there's you know could, there probably could be 10 more af uh, challenges after this but do you do you like the questions we're asking and do you want more and i think that's the thing to keep in mind more than uh, you know what what the exact findings are because they're, they're imperfect. Uh, and, and really as you think about that, think about how your organization could benefit from knowing more about each other and what areas, because this is just IT benchmarking, perhaps there are other areas that we can collaborate on and um, be able to gather some information. So I'd love to, a year from now, be at a summit telling you a lot more about yourselves and letting others learn a lot more about yourselves. I think that's uh, part of what NetHelp is here to do, and I am gonna pass it over to David so you can actually talk about the results. Thank you. So, uh, oh, here's the mic. So, um, I'm sure most of these will be familiar um, to all of you, uh, So, but I'll just go through them quickly. We, uh, again, as Alex said, the, the, uh, the, the meeting that neither of us were at in Barcelona, I think it was Mark Banbury who used these ratios in a presentation. Others said, no, that, let's, let's look at them. So, the, Traditional ones are the amount of money spent on IT as a percentage of the overall organization revenue. That's sort of a classic. Um, the amount of money spent on IT per employee and the number of ITFTs as a percentage of employees. So those, those we decided to sort of try to connect with those ratios and see where, and I'll sh you'll see that I've, I've used their averages and compared them to our averages. Um, 
the thing to think about is what, what are the net home specific ratios? So the one I wrote there was connectivity spend as a percentage of, of IT budget. It would be interesting to see how much each organization spends on connectivity as a percentage of their overall budget. Um, we didn't we asked a question about communication, but pulling that out was complicated, so we, we don't have a slide to show. But you know, are there more net home specific, NGO specific ratios that we should be considering? So that's something to think about as we, as we go forward. Okay, so um, we always start with a theory about the world, and the theory that I started with anyway was that there are a few of these kind of impactful attributes that uh, I thought might affect these ratios. The first one is the delivery model. I think Michael Dugan uh, had this idea is, we asked the question, do you deliver services directly or do you go mostly through partners or somewhere in between? It was a, uh, a one to four scale. So we thought, well, you know, maybe that has an impact. Maybe direct service delivery organizations spend more, spend less than, than partner organizations. So that's one question we asked. Um, my favorite always was, um, how much unrestricted funding does your organization get? Does that have an impact on the amount of money you spend on IT? And uh, size, do the big organizations spend more? So those are just some, some initial theories we had, uh, and we'll see whether they have borne out. So the first thing we looked at was the IT budget as, as a percentage of revenue. Now, again, the data's soft here, so, so don't, don't focus too much on who, the, who is spending over 6%. Um, you know, if, if we really had the time to pull that out, it might come down a little bit, might even go up a little bit, although that's unlikely. So, um, so what you're seeing, the black line, which you can't see the text on, is the net hope average, which is? 2.8%, thank you. 2.8%, doesn't that surprising to anybody? About 2.8% of uh, organizational revenue spent on IT, that, that's about the number we've generally used, a little bit high, a little low. The, the Gartner industry average, which I'm almost certain does not include our sector, is 3.2%, which also seems rather low. But, um, so that's interesting. So then the question is, is there any correlation between those other attributes I mentioned uh, which again, the size, the percentage of unrestricted, and um, the uh, d delivery model. Now, if we were survey professionals, we would have what's called a scattergram, which would show correlation. We're not gonna have a scattergram. I just sorted them. So it seems to me, I mean, I'm not sure I know what it is, to be honest with you. Um, I think I've seen one. So um, I just figured if, if there was correlation, and we sorted by those attributes, the shape of the, of the curve, so to speak, would be the same. And in fact, it's not. Okay, so I've sorted by size, we've sorted by percentage of unrestricted, and we've sorted by service delivery model, and you know, we're not seeing much of a correlation. It's, it, it's all over the place. It's not like the bigger ones spend more. It's not like the one who have more unrestricted spend more. It's a mish, mishmash. Yeah, okay. Feel free to jump in with questions or comments if anyone cares to, except Vincent, he can't ask any questions because he didn't fill out a <coughs> survey. Um, <laughs> Um, so next we'll look at, <laughs> yes, because, because we like you, um, or we did anyway. Um, so then we have IT budget per employee, and again, uh, net up average, it says here is 5,500, Gartner average is, 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 uh, is 12,000. There isn't anyone who's spending over $25,000, uh, on a, so that, that number is a little bit soft, uh, but again, gives you a, a, a flavor for it. So again, is there correlation? No. Not, it's not like the big guys spend more. It's not like those who have more unrestricted spend more. It's not like the direct service delivery folks spend more. Right? Correlation by IQ. By IQ, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, IQ of, yes? Uh, this, one, this, one this one? Don't look too hard. <laughs> Um, and then we last, we looked at the IT FTE as a percentage of employees, net hope average being 3.4%, Gartner being 5.1%, and again, no significant correlation, which was not what I expected. As some of you know, I've had a theory for a while that those who have uh, a higher percentage of unrestricted funding tend to spend more on IT. But the data, at least this initial data doesn't bear that out, which is interesting. So one question I've been asking is, you know, if we if we go back and tighten the data up, if we get more data, will we will will correlation appear? I'd like to find out. And and if any of you know if you all want to know, just let us know, and we'll we'll keep going. Michael in the back, be nice. Do we make any attempt to account for shadow IT expense? I mean, th that's sort of where the data. I mean, we we asked everyone for their budgets. If they didn't 
uh, uh, you know, so the numbers they put in there are the numbers we put. So we didn't specifically ask for. We asked for budgets at headquarters, budgets at fundraising offices, and budgets at um, in the field. Um, so we didn't particularly ask for. And we did ask for a kind of a confidence level, but we again didn't find that to be useful enough information to to to, to graph. Uh, hold on, uh, Jim. Was that go, Jim? Did someone have a microphone? There's okay. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you, Frederick. Yeah. With IT staff, there was infrastructure costs, but where we really broke down was all the applications that are scattered, some central, some not. Is there any way we could maybe do this again, but simplify it and try to, I, I don't know if we can get yes. estimates or maybe even give confidence intervals that we have to help you look at the data. Yes, I mean, the answer to that question is absolutely. There, 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 again, if this, you know, the, if you like this flavor, if this information is useful and helpful, there's a huge amount more we can do. It's not trivial. It's not, um, uh, uh, you know, it's not gonna be easy because we're trying to make apples and apples out of a, you know, a potpourri of fruit, if there is such a thing. Um, and, and, and that's not easy to do. And, and I suspect that's why the gardeners of the world, you know, have what they have and spend what they spend on this sort of stuff. But but I think that's interesting. So I think to keep that in mind as we go forward and, and as we get a rousing, yes, let's do this, we'll come back to some of these specifics. Frederick has, oh, Carol. Yeah, um, uh, one of the things in, in comparing to Gartner Average is it would be important to compare it by industry because the industry, there's a real range. If you look at manufacturing, it's very Absolutely. different than yeah. like consulting services. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we might do ourselves, a, it might, you know, a disfavor so, if we don't compare to a similar industry. Well, what, which would be what, do you think, Carol? What, what's the similar industry to compare it to? Um, a knowledge industry like consulting, actually. Okay, I, I don't remember whether, I mean, so I, I asked this to myself the same question and nothing jumped out, so I said, well, they publish a industry average, one number, so I grabbed that, but you're right. I mean, it would be interesting to, to I mean, we could have a, a whole session on what industry is our peer in that way, so thank you. Uh, just a couple of points from the, I guess, the original survey design discussion and picking up shadow IT. In an ideal world, we said we would try and capture IT spend split between run costs and project investments or new capability, and which of course also Gartner track and you've got your 65-35 or your 70-30 type right. ratios. Um, and then on shadow IT, we said what we would certainly want to do, ideally, the respondents should be if there were known IT budgets that were controlled outside of IT, then please estimate them and tell us what they are. So it wasn't just the CIO's IT budget, it was the organization's IT budget. But what we recognized we probably wouldn't get was IT embedded in program budgets, almost semi-controlled by donors. So I think we all felt that there was a certain amount of IT, which personally I don't call shadow IT, but you know, it's IT which is almost embedded in the program design and delivery and often not even budgeted as IT. It's logistics or right. telecoms or something. Right. So that's where we yeah. came to. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, all right. So now we get to play with Tableau a little bit, which I'm very nervous about. But we'll David, can we take one more question? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, I'm nervous. <coughs> So, David, on the two, two, two points, on yeah. the Gartner uh, indexes, I agree with Carol. We actually look at three of them. I think it's educational, service, and consulting. Okay. And uh, as, a, as a comparison to, uh, to our ratios. Okay. On shadow IT spending, really hard to get to. Maybe some of you have a finance system that, that enables you to pull this out readily. We had Price Waterhouse come in and study five years of all financial transactions with the blessing of the finance department. And they looked at, we gave them a list of about 15 keywords that were IT related. And they pulled out all of the transactions that had anything to do with an IT project, wow. application, and so forth. The percentage was staggering. Outside of IT management or view, 53% of the organization spend on IT. And so essentially, been, double your budget. More than double the budget. Double and so the now budget. that's a huge wake-up call in the organization. But it's really hard to get to that. If yeah. anybody wants to do that exercise, so Price Waterhouse has a great way of doing right, it. Right, right. So a couple of questions. How many transactions w w were there that oh. they have to go through? 
H hundreds of thousands, presumably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, right. I wouldn't be surprised if it approached a million. Right. Um, right. And how long did it take them to comb through that? Uh, it was a, probably about a 30-day project. Oh, okay. I mean and they, they put it in their own database engine right. and ran the study. Right. And how, how close did they get to, I mean, did they, did they over account for things that they shouldn't have? In other words, you gave them 15 keywords that it, were there a lot of false positives essentially, oh no, that's not really an IT, it looks like it is, but it isn't, or they got pretty accurate with those keywords. So they, the, the step that they had to follow was when they got the results, they went back to the finance department and said, would you validate, you know, these as being legitimate or not? And so they right. went through that step. I see, okay, but, and, but presumably someone in IT also validated it. Yeah, yeah, and so we cleaned the data and the result was still 53%. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. That's interesting stuff. Michael. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's consistent. Yeah. Well, it sounds like shadow IT is an important uh, topic for everybody, which is, which is good. All right, so let's, should we get to the Tableau stuff? Because it's, it's spent a lot of time. All right, so uh, let's see if this is going to work. Out of uh -huh. For those who want to uh, follow along on the slides, of course, the slides are in the online agenda, so. <laughs> okay, so it doesn't show up on that, so I think what I'll do is go like. You're going to drag it over to the other slide. There you go. Whoa. Okay, so then what we did, and I'm going to have to try to draw. Oh, I think I can, oh, I can probably do it like this. Let's see. All right, so this is Tableau. For those of you who don't know, Tableau Online, which is a pretty cool tool. Uh, it's, ju it's essentially a full-featured product that just runs in a browser. Um, so we asked the question, what is your level of involvement in the headquarters uh, and field uh, for those different categories of IT? And we just, you know, service desk support, uh, infrastructure, you know, customized off-the-shelf software, uh, custom, so uh, you know, customizable off-the-shelf software, sorry, um, you know, package software, uh, custom software, and ICD for D. So um, you'll see that, um, not surprisingly, uh, for headquarters, um, and these numbers, by the way, uh, are the top two boxes. So 96% of, of the respondents had a high or moderate degree of influence and control over service desk at headquarters. Not, not a surprise. And so you can see that as we get into the field, which is the second section down here, you know, we see a little more of this sort of dark orange, light orange stuff, which is to say, you know, our, our level of influence and control, you know, reduces a bit as we get to the field. Again, not, not a surprise. Um, so um, actually, let me just do this because I can. This is so much fun here. I'm going to uncheck this, I think. There we go. Okay. Oh, there we go. Right, just to keep it easy. So then we can say, let's look at um, what if we said, let's only show those that have a greater than 60% unrestricted. Okay, so a lot less orange and red, right? What if we said, um, let's only select, so let's go back and select all and say, let's select only those that are, um, uh, you know, direct service delivery. You know, again, it's very small sample size, so, you know, that, that's sort of why you're, you're seeing it like this. So is it really true that 100% have, you know, but generally speaking, uh, let's look at uh, the size of the organization. So we'll click select all there. And uh, we just say, let's only show the large organizations, which I believe are over, uh, Alex, you remember, is over 500 million, something like that, 300 million, I think. So again, you know, surprising, even the large organizations struggle with uh, uh, the amount of oversight and some of the things in the, I in the field. So this, you know, I, I, if this is interesting, you can play with this all day, obviously, different selects, different sorts. This is really where the power of Tableau comes in. Um, so, you know, again, we can see correlation a little bit here. Does it matter if you're big? Not, a little bit, not significantly. Does it matter if you do direct service delivery? A little bit, not, not significantly. So, um, and then the other thing we looked at here, and I, this is sort of the last thing I'll do, is, um, uh, let me just go here, unselect this, unselect this, sorry, it's just, like Steve Jobs up here. Okay, so there we go. So now if we say the level of involvement in key applications, um, uh, you know, again, mostly blue with, you know, essentially, I mean, what st struck out at me is, you know, just under half of you would say you have a higher moderate degree of infrastructure over the website social media technology, which is also consistent. Um, uh, Lauren?
Yes. I'm not sure how, but I will figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Click around. Yes. Yeah, and, and just, I mean, again, I don't want to make this too much of a tableau, um, although I see Neil with a big smile on his face. Yeah. Um, what, you, what we can do, if, I mean, what I should say, what can be done, uh, I'm told, is a way of showing where you are. So, we, you know, you see we're not putting any names up here, um, and we've done that for obvious reasons, but we can give each individual member a way to see where they are in the thing and all that sort of stuff. Not with the current resources without a lot of help from, from our friends at Tableau, but I did, we did get a pretty good sense from, from uh, the, uh, the Zen master we finally talked to, uh, and just really sophisticated stuff we can do. So I can certainly share this out. I think it's, a, it's uh, I'm sure Neil is a way for me to just publicize this link out, um, uh, and, and people can click around all, all day, uh, and then we will think a little bit about where, but again, I want to caution us. You know, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to suggest that we, we go back and try to get this data in, a be in better shape, get more data from more members, and then begin to socialize it. Um, so anyway, I, I don't know that I need to go, but, you know, go back through this. So I'll, I'm, I'm not going to click around anymore because uh, I think you get the idea. Uh, but I will make this available so at least you can, A, get a, a flavor for what this is, and B, get a sense of, of, of Tableau's capabilities. Um, so that's essentially it. So, so again, I, I, I don't want to do a show of hands particularly, but just, you know, for those of you who think, hey, this is great stuff. We want NetHope to do more of this. You need to tell us, make it clear, um, and then we'll figure out a way to do that because, uh, you know, I think it's important. I think it's interesting. It's certainly got a good discussion going. There's a lot more to do. We can really make this much more robust. Um, and um, thank you for your time. Any other last questions about the NetHope side of things before I turn it over to Eric? Eric, did you want to uh, say an intro or since, or not really? No, he doesn't. Okay, <laughs> I'll do it then. So Eric Walker is here. Uh, Eric uh, was, uh, had a number of senior management positions without C titles, I'm told, at PATH, which is why Eric knows him. Uh, he left because there can't be two Erics, I guess, in the same organization. If I'm a C, he's a K. So oh, right, of course, yes, of course, yes, exactly, exactly. That may be why he became a K, because he's, um, and now Eric is working with Inside NGO, doing some very interesting stuff uh, around sort of benchmarking, really more on the operational side. And so, you know, Eric connected us. We've been talking a little bit. So he's going to give a, a, a presentation on, on the work he's doing. Uh, and, and in fact, really what I think may come out is that there's an interesting uh, collaboration that's possible. Um, and so, Eric, take it away. Now I have to find your slides. This is a server, by the way. It's a server. Nice. No, no, it's it's Pro Prodric. Okay. <laughs> Prodric, okay. There you go. Lauren, by the way, you can get to this data because it's on this link in the online agenda. So download the slides, click this link, and oh. you get to the unless it's behind a password that I'm not sure. We'll hack through that too, don't you worry you about it. Already? I'm Is it? That's it. Here we go. Is that okay? All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, NetHope and Inside NGO have collaborated on a number of things over the years, and uh, this is potential for uh, further collaboration. Now, um, when I, I talked to David and Alex, the idea was that I would bring some perspective from 30 some years working in international development uh, on the back office side. And um, one of the things that's been really important over the years has been whether or not we can benchmark to our peers. Now, I'm not wild about the word benchmark because I think of it as you find something that's ideal and you try and replicate that. Like in the automobile industry, maybe a BMW 325 and Ford says, we have to match that. Well, I don't think that in our sector in international development do we have benchmarks necessarily. So it's more about peer data, comparing ourselves to our peers. I think it's a better way to talk about it, but the B word comes up so quickly, people say benchmark all the time. Now, the other thing that uh, about this quick presentation is that I was really impressed about yesterday when Lauren talked about wallowing in the data, and it is actually not a very easy route from complexity to simplicity. You have to do a lot of data wallowing, and I think your example is very good, and that's what we found in our survey. Um, when I uh, left PATH and I decided I was going to work for, you know, uh, several more years, I said, you know, I would really like to try and do something to make a difference. I thought about what that would be, and I thought, well, you know, 
I should think big, right? This is going to be a career capper. So I should think of a big, hairy, audacious goal. Remember BHAGs, that phrase? So I said, what if, what if we could get private foundations to stop capping overhead and pay full cost of whatever we have to do our work? Yes, all right. We're working on a movement here. And I said, why not? Go for it. Let's see what we can do. Now, I'd done mostly finance work over all those years, and I actually have become known as a master, somebody even called me a Jedi master, in repackaging budgets so that a funder would pay full cost. PATH had very little unrestricted funds, and in order to protect the bottom line, we had to repackage aggressively, effectively, and most of the time, we were successful without very little co-fund or putting unrestricted funds against the unrestricted. So uh, this is what you're about to see is learning and experience from that world. So I went to Inside NGO with my grand BHAG and said, wouldn't you like to play in this game? Wouldn't it be cool? And it may have had something. They said yes, and it may have had something to do with the fact that I'm one of the six founders of Inside NGO. But they, regardless, I got to play in the sandbox with this because all members needed this information. So to think about the grand scheme before I talk more about our, our um, survey is to think back, step back and say, what benchmarks could matter to us in our sector? Well, program impact benchmarks, of course, is the holy grail. Staff turnover rates is interesting in HR, overhead rates overall, and within operation services, what is some kind of measure against a metric like uh, services per 100 staff? So let me look at each of those real quick. Um, in program impact, it's difficult because of lack of commonly accepted measures across our diverse program set. But there's some people that are trying to do this. Um, and I'll talk about four, the impact genome project, charting impact, SDGs, and the performance imperative. The first one is, is the impact genome project, which is very interesting in that um, it's this group called Mission Measurement that have thought about their big, hairy, audacious goal, which is what if we could map across the whole social sector a reasonable number of indicators that we could use across the social sector to compare performance organization to organization. And so they hired the guy that uh, came up with the algorithm for Pandora to figure out what music we wanted to listen to next. Now, regardless of whether he got that right or not, he at least came up with about 12 factors that determined what we wanted to listen to next. So a mission measurement brought him on board and said, what if we could do that across these multiple parts of, social, of the social sector? So at the bottom, you see international development. You see all the kind of the classic areas of uh, social sector work. The progress they've made so far is in uh, places where there already is a lot of data, like, for example, housing and STEM within education. There's a lot of data to go look at to see if you could figure out the Pandora equivalent of the 6 to 12 indicators for each of those. So I the idea is that they're setting up working groups across each of these major sectors. I don't think one for international development has actually happened yet, but they're, he's pushing this forward, seeking funding. The challenge he has right now, the mission measurement leader has right now, is that um, a lot. Of, most people are taking a wait and see attitude. Like, for sure, you think you can really pull this off? And very few are willing to go first. At least that's the Gates Foundation position. Is let's wait and see what happens. But it's one idea of try to trying to put the whole thing in a single package. Another one is um, developed by. Uh, on the lead by GuideStar. GuideStar is a group in the US that put all the Form 990 data e online accessible to individuals uh, and people who want to fund organizations. And uh, Jacob Harrell, the leader of GuideStar, all along has been saying, you know, what really matters is outcomes and ultimately impact. So we should get people off the 990s and thinking about what makes a difference in our work and are we doing what we said we would do? And so he and some other colleagues have come up with these five questions called charting impact. And asking charities, uh, nonprofits, to voluntarily answer these questions. What do you aim to accomplish? What are your strategies? What are your capabilities? Any progress? And what have you actually accomplished? And he has um, about 300,000 charities in the US that have filled these out. And so it's beginning to be a collection of data for someone who wants to fund a charity to come in and say, OK, are they doing what they said they would do, instead of looking at inappropriate proxies like overhead rates. 
So this is a kind of a, a, a self-join approach that uh, is getting some traction and Jacob, Her Jacob Harrell's doing some very interesting thinking about how to put this in a way that people can access it. The sustainable development goals, you know, the, the new, gosh, you see this image all over. You can even buy a flag in the little gift shop for these. Um, that um, is trying to say this is what's important in terms of programmatic impact in our sector and the extent to which um, people are buying into this. There was an annual partners meeting with Gates Foundation. I'm from Seattle, so I have most of my data points come out of that particular foundation. I never worked for them, but took a lot of their money over the years and tried to figure out how they actually do what they do. Um, and uh, there's some skepticism about the SDGs, right? Uh, are they too complicated? Are they too simple? Uh, are there too many measurements? How in the world are we going to accomplish this? What about the MDGs? And did we learn enough from those? There's a very, very good podcast uh, linked to a website called humanosphere.org, which is an international development uh, news site um, that uh, has a really good interview with an individual that talks about some of the trade-offs of SDGs and why they're better and why they're not. So if you're interested in how those are emerging as a potential program impact tool, that's a good place to start. Another newly emerging place where this uh, measuring our organizational performance more broadly may come out uh, is this uh, diagram that's labeled the performance imperative. Uh, this came out of the work of Mario Marino, who was a, uh, a capitalist turned philanthropist that invested in about 15 nonprofit organizations in the U.S. to see if he could find out what would really work as an open-minded, full-funding uh, philanthropist and has drawn conclusions from that work over about a decade of work of seeing what would work and has come up with these seven pillars for high performance. Um, and he has a list of people that have signed on to it, which is a pretty impressive list of Leap of Reason ambassadors that um, are trying to say this could be a standard that we use. They're uh, working on an assessment tool and the like. So there's another approach that might actually be something useful to talk about our organizational effectiveness. Now, there's, there's one place in part of our sector where data is being collected and analyzed and visualized in a pretty effective way, and that's the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation uh, connected with the University of Washington. And um, they have collected global um, health indicator data from every source they could find, and if, I think they may be using Tableau in their visualization technique, I'm not sure. But that is hard to use for us to say we're doing well it's how the world is doing in terms of global health. So that's also a challenge in terms of program impact. So while some or organizations have built impact models within their organizations, peer to peer, th there hasn't been much that emerges yet. Perhaps in the relief sector, there's something that's more emerging, but in my experience, it's not happened yet in terms of program. HR, a classic, <coughs> is staff turnover rates, and you can go out and find data about staff turnover rates. It's an important operational figure because if you're losing a lot of talent, um, you should know if you're losing more than your peer organizations are losing. And the data is not very useful in terms of what is out there. So here's a survey that was done by nonprofit HR, just published in 2015, showing uh, staff turnover rates across the for the past three years. And the rule of thumb I've always used within our sector has been about 18%, so I thought this was pretty good data. Until I looked at the voluntary and involuntary turnover. And um, in our sector, I find that our involuntary turnover numbers are really high, and we have to adjust for it. And why are they really high? Because projects shut down, and you lay off a bunch of people, and they don't always bridge to the next project, or they say, hey, I want you to lay me off so you can pay me the severance and then rehire me for the next project I'm gonna be on, because that's how they can improve uh, their own cash flow, and it's a common practice in many places where we work. So the point here about turnover rates is, I think the total number's good, but in our sector, you always have to adjust out high swings in involuntary turnover. These are all a lot of smaller U.S. domestic nonprofits, so the data source doesn't necessarily align with um, our data set, but at least there's something out there. So in terms of overhead rates, uh, 
we wanted to try and come up with a way to say, here are overhead rates that are at least reasonably peer-to-peer. -peer. There's so many different ways that people uh, compute their overhead rates that it makes the comparison very difficult. So we tried to answer two questions. One was, how do our overhead rates compare to our peers, as I've mentioned? And the second and is, what is the right level of staffing for functions like finance, HR, IT, grants, compliance, and the like? So we collected data on overhead, and we also collected data on FTE and cost across the major functions within a nonprofit. Our cohort size was 59, and we had a pretty good bell curve across size. So you can see in that 50 to 100 million was the peak of the bell curve. We got some smalls, we got some bigs. Um, and so we collected our data, we built our form, also learn as we go, wrote instructions, and uh, told people where to start with their 990, and then we gave them instructions about what to adjust out so we could come up with apples to apples. And maybe it's like delicious to Fuji, it's not one type of apple, but we think we came close. So in trying to answer some of these questions, does size matter, does type of work matter and the like, here's the first chart. Um, and what's important to look at first is the title of the chart. It's called Range of Adjusted M&G Rates by Org Size. Adjusted M&G means adjusted management in general. And the idea here is to try and come up with the cost that it takes to run the corporation. Not the other things that get added in typically to overhead, especially if you're working with the U.S. government and have a NICRA, like program support or field support or those costs that you will load into your overhead rate with the U.S. government because you know they will pay for it and it's a good way to fund um, your organization. So we tried to strip those extras out and come up with just what it takes to run the organization and we call that adjusted management in general. So here in size, the smalls and the bigs are low. Well, we know why the bigs are low and that's because those data points include big child survival or child sponsorship agencies that raise a lot of money from individuals. And it's imperative because of our strange culture of believing that 90 cents in the dollar must go to program and it only takes 10 cents in the dollar to run our organization, which is a total falsehood. But everybody still believes that. These organizations use accounting, appropriate accounting measures to lower the numerator. We call it buying down the rate. They'll take unrestricted funds and use those funds to offset costs that are incurred in the numerator in order to lower that rate. So the bigs are an anomaly. Now the smalls are kind of an anomaly too because they're more in startup. They have half a dozen projects. It's still easy to direct cost everything out to those projects. What's left is a small amount for overhead. But in that middle range, there's some variability, particularly around the kind of growing or emerging organizations where the overhead rates are higher because they haven't yet become large enough to see the economies of scale that those in the other side of the bell curve where the rates begin to drop off. Where you, you just, your program base grows faster than the numerator and so it drives the percentage down. Are you still in starvation cycle? Absolutely. Like how many of you feel like you don't have enough IT staff or budget in order to do the work? I understand that was a comment often heard in the first day. It's reality, we are in the starvation cycle. So these numbers reflect what the overhead rates are of organizations that are in the starvation cycle and don't have enough money to do their work. So we've been careful about putting this data out because we don't want funders to think that the magic number is 18.2%, right? Because they already, many of them now think that 15% is the magic number. But this is only to run the corporation and doesn't have program support or field support added in. So we're trying to decide the best way to communicate this out to the funder community in a way that uh, helps them see that it is variable. I think the number one lesson from our survey is that one size does not fit all. And many of the funder community believes that one size does fit all. So what's interesting about the triangles is that, is that those are the median points within the 59 responses. And the line behind the triangle is the range of responses. So there's a pretty big range across these different organization size sets. So we're using this to try and say, look, remember, one size does not fit all. If you're just doing 15%, it's not enough for everybody. You're crowding out critical organizations that you may want to partner or work with. The second is, does the nature of work matter? And so we took our data set and tried to differentiate between the nature of the work 
um, that people do. <laughs> it's really interesting. I asked a colleague of mine to, to go to the websites and make sure we're assuming the right thing about what people do. And they came back to me and, and she said, you know, just on the website, everybody does the same thing. The words, the presentation, the branding, everybody's using the same bu buzzwords about what they do. So she had, she had to click down deeper, look deeper to see if she could differentiate, and we found this category, these categories of organizations. And we know there was only one data point in ag development, so I'm not sure that that's an outlier. But there's movement within that kind of high teens, mid 20s adjusted M and G rate, like we saw some movement around size. So nature of work matters a little bit, but again, our data set may not be large enough to confirm. The next question is whether the amount of unrestricted funding matters, thinking like David did that, well, if you have lots of unrestricted money, you must have a lot of flexibility about how you spend it. But this force of keeping the overhead rate low in the face of raising money from individuals is a really powerful force. You know, it's like feel the force, Luke, now that we're approaching Star Wars reemerging. Um, it keeps those costs uh, down and not being highly invested in. So if you look at this particular graph, those that have a lot of individual giving on the left, so these are ordered left to right with um, high levels of individual giving, which we're using as a proxy for unrestricted funds or flexible funds. And you can see that the adjusted M and G rate doesn't correlate. In fact, there's an upward trend toward, um, a slightly upward trend with M and G rates going up with diminishing um, unrestricted funds. So that wasn't too helpful in trying to draw in conclusions. The next one is, does the amount of subagreements matter? That's the inference that you partner with others a lot instead of doing the work just yourselves. And in this particular look, the red curve represents the percent of subs as, as a percent of total spending of the year. And as those drop off, we see a downward trend in the adjusted M&G, which it, to me makes sense because managing subs is a lot of work. It's quite the pain in the fill in the blank, right? Because you have to have monitoring programs and you have to make sure they're doing what they said they would do and there's audit requirements and the like, so maybe Partnering with others is, in fact, more expensive than less. But many donors want to see it because they believe collaboration and others working together is a good thing. A couple indicators about uh, functional areas um, that have come out of the survey is that the finance staff headcount, or FTE per 100 employees, the median is 1.86. Notice across the x-axis is the full FTE of the respondents. Uh, so as you become smaller, your investing in finance goes up, and that's validated by one of the BridgePen studies that shows that we spend more in finance as nonprofits than for-profits, and in fact, um, the smaller size indicates you have to spend that money first to make sure you can protect the money. In HR, the median is 0.91. There's that old rule of thumb of, of one HR person per 100 employees. Are you above or below it? So we are slightly below. And when IT staff, this measurement we're using 0.97, but in both of these, there's a lot of variability as was seen in your survey. So, so what now what? So we have the beginning of some data um, and we need more sources. So there's the Net Hope survey, the Inside NGO survey, Mango, the management assistant NGOs out of the UK is about to publish their results. And I was on the phone yesterday with a small group in Belgium that is surveying Belgium NGOs because they're in the midst of negotiating with the Belgian government about what they're gonna do about overhead rate cap change. Um, this da these data were useful. See, I've hung around program people a lot. I've learned to say these data instead of this data. You never notice that. Um, these data help uh, conversations with funders. Uh, we've been in the room with Gates. We've been in the room with other early adopter foundations beginning to get them to change their perspective. It's a slow process. Big tankers turn slowly. So we're, in, we're getting close to the wheelhouse actually though, so we may be having some effect. We need a place to go to look at the data. So this is a way that uh, Inside NGO and NetHo will be talking about where's the right place to put this and how can we accept, access it in a way that's useful and, and dynamic. Um, we're also collecting some data, for example, on um, donor restrictions. We're trying to put up it would be beautiful if we could make it into a wiki 
where uh, members publish what they know about restrictions donors have for funding, and then that's a dynamic tool that's updated as people find out more and donors change their point of view. On the solution side, we think the NetHope Inside NGO Partnership is a way to, to come to solution, and somehow we need to develop a data-driven community culture. And what I mean by that is that we don't necessarily feel compelled to want to put this information someplace for the community. We think of it as a nice thing. That would be okay, but it's not critical data yet. In the private sector, there's trade associations that collect critical data that everybody wants and is willing to give up to a certain point because they need to know what's happening in their market and who has share and the like. We don't, haven't found that place yet, and so figuring out how we will want to be able to put data into these sets uh, I think is an important part of what has to change. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much.